Good evening, mesdames et messieurs, and welcome to this evening's edition of Climate, the National Climate League's uh, training webinar series, uh, training camp for uh, national, uh, or pardon me, for community climate hubs wanting to make use of the open database uh, of the National Climate League. So the final standings have been released and they are available at climatehub.ca. Uh, tonight, as I mentioned, uh, the third installment of our training series with uh, Diego Kramer of the, of the David Suzuki Foundation. Uh, he'll be speaking to us about media relations and how to attract media attention, how to um, draw data into uh, a story that will uh, get you, you know, into, uh, onto the journalist's um, uh, radars. Uh, this webinar, of course, follows two others that took place last week and the week prior. Uh, the first one being on how to navigate the open database itself, and the second one uh, being on how to visualize the, the, the data once you've, uh, once you've found the data and extracted the data, how to turn it into something that is visually compelling. So um, we'll go quickly through um, details of what we're all doing here this evening. Climate Reality Project, uh, which is running these uh, webinars and is, has launched this campaign to support municipal initiatives across the country, is uh, part of a national uh, an international network of climate reality branches. So in Canada, we have about 900 climate reality leaders, and this is the latest crop um, that came out of the Los Angeles training in August. If you're interested in um, applying to attend a training with Al Gore about the um, solutions and uh, best practices and communications around uh, climate change, then you can apply. The next two trainings that are nearby are in Atlanta in March and in Minneapolis in August. Uh, there are also trainings this year in um, Melbourne, Australia, and in Tokyo, Japan. So the Community Climate Hub Initiative uh, focuses on equipping local citizen-driven and diverse groups to move the needle on these five, um, this, these five uh, steps in the milestone process of measuring emissions, setting a target, developing a local action plan, implementing the plan, and monitor, monitoring results uh, with the objective of decarbonizing their municipalities by 2050, uh, which is a target that a number of municipalities have now uh, agreed to in Canada, which is very exciting. But you can imagine there are 3,600 municipalities in Canada, so we're far from getting all of those municipalities on board. Um, here you have the toolkit which Climate Reality has developed to support your work in your communities. Um, and tonight, of course, the top one on the left, webinars. Um, uh, we provide uh, access to some of the most brilliant minds of the environmental movement and other movements across the country. And you can now view over 100 webinars at climatehub.ca. Um, there are uh, also a number of other tools. The, one we are focused on this evening is the National Climate League. So we have gone through a process lasting over a year now to identify which numbers matter the most to Canadians in their communities uh, and uh, have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So yes, we're measuring greenhouse gas emissions through this um, league to compete against each other and to see who can reduce faster, but we're also measuring proxies for those emissions. So who can uh, which cities can lead on jobs and sustainability because we know, for example, that when people draw their income from working on something that is sustainable and working on something that is aligned with, um, you know, a, a sustainable future and a sustainable economy, uh, politically, the implement, implementing those solutions becomes much more realistic. And of course, we have rationale for all of these 15 uh, indicators. Um, they've been collected over the last uh, three months. The data has been uh, collected in September, uh, October, and November. Um, and, and now we're very, very pleased to have released this report that is available at, uh, at um, climatehub.ca. And without further ado, I will just uh, show you where to find this data uh, quickly here. So this is climatehub.ca. Clicking on the benchmarking section will take you to, uh, or pardon me, the... Um, the webinar section will take you to the webinars uh, and the benchmarking section will take you to the, uh, the data. Pardon me, I'll, I'll take a, a moment to spin through that afterwards. So without further ado, uh, Diego Kramer, 
I have jumped to the, the French one here, here that's the English one, uh, will join us. He is, uh, since 2016, the um, Public Affairs and Communications Specialist at the David Suzuki Foundation for Quebec and Eastern Canada, uh, and uh, has also a, worked for uh, CBC in the past um, as a video journalist, uh, studied journalism in his native uh, Argentina, and uh, has also a couple of other very uh, interesting um, achievements to his name, uh, notably the co-founding of Demain, Demain Verdun, uh, which is a local uh, neighborhood group in Verdun who has a four objective to uh, reduce Verdun's um, uh, environmental footprint and increase sustainable lifestyles in Verdun, and a co-author of uh, Demain Le uh, Québec, Le Québec, Demain Le Québec. And uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about that right now. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Diego, and uh, sharing with us how uh, we can best leverage our uh, data in the media. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you uh, to all of you for uh, being here tonight. It's, uh, it's very encouraging in, in the environmental crisis that we are all in to uh, see uh, groups being so quickly uh, organized uh, all across the country. And uh, uh, you're part of one of them, I'm part of another one, and um, this is moving really, really fast. It's, it's really encouraging. So uh, with no further ado, I'm gonna show you my presentation um, that I tailored for, for you today. And actually I translated it today because the original is in French. Um, you will notice I have a strong accent uh, for your information. I have a strong accent in every language, in English, in French, and even in my native Spanish. So I, I'm an accent guy. Um, this, this training, um, I, it has evolved through the years and it actually, um, I, I, I studied with Greenpeace Canada. I spoke for many years. I um, worked for many years for uh, Greenpeace Canada in the, in the Arctic campaign when we were opposing uh, offshore oil drilling in Alaska, in Russia, seismic uh, testing in the, in the north, in the Canadian Arctic. And uh, basically having worked for, for the CBC uh, in radio, that was my, 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 my media, um, and having worked with uh, with journalists and uh, in, in, in journalistic teams uh, for a number of years, and then then being on the other side of the road, that's with with the NGOs, with the civil society, and trying to um, pitch stories and to establish dialogues. Um, I try to make a summary of what makes a conversation relevant. What makes a a conversation uh, pertinent and uh, how we can advance uh, newsworthy information uh, that uh, we have uh, with us, that we have created, that we have retrieved, that we have discovered, um, and, and bring it to the attention of journalists uh, and uh, use media as a conveyor belt. Um, to, to reach a larger audience, uh, always the, with the ultimate goal of, of creating uh, momentum, of creating mobilization, and of creating political pressure. So, um, let me go to the presentation. Why work with media? That's, uh, that's a very good question. At, at one point in, 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 in this new century, uh, some people advance the idea that uh, social media was uh, or had lar largely um, replaced traditional media. And it was true, it's still true, but only to certain extents. Um, social media uh, has not developed the, the validation uh, systems that traditional media developed in the last uh, 100 years. So uh, verifying information, it's still a very important process in the transmission of, of news. And um, social media has given a voice to many people who did not have a voice before, but has not developed like uh, the sophisticated systems that um, media with uh, large budgets and um, ethic codes 
uh, and controls, internal control system have uh, to guarantee that the information that it transmitted is uh, actually accurate and it's true. So when we succeed in bringing information to traditional media, in a way we are also validating our information. If it gets through the filter of traditional media like CBC, the Canadian press, you name it, um, it's actually taken more seriously on the other side, not, all with, not only by the larger audience, people sitting at home in front of their TVs or driving and listening to radio or reading the newspapers, but also by elected officials and decision makers. Uh, so in, we have to consider it not, not as, a, um, as a barrier or as an obstacle, but rather as a validation system that can take our message even further. And the, the, the funny thing of this is that it comes back to social media and social media can reappropriate stories that have been filtered and validated by, by um, traditional media. So it's not a, a dead end road. Uh, working with traditional media can actually have a very positive impact in social media and in uh, separating uh, fake news and rumors from verified information. So in a way, we should consider them allies, uh, even though they do not talk uh, to a very large audience as other channels can do today, but they still have this rigorous system of verifying information that it's useful to, to the causes that we want to advance. So with media and with journalists, uh, we can uh, carry on, carry forward our influence strategy. Uh, that strategy usually in most opportunities include uh, media interviews where we deliver our key messages. So for instance, I put this person in front of uh, Lake Ontario saying this future lake behind me is being polluted, uh, polluted as we talk. That's, uh, that's part of a, of a key message. And it, it it's, may look silly, but it's, it's a situation that we do want to be near the problem, giving our opinion of the problem and most uh, more, more uh, important, giving uh, our vision or for the solution of the problem. So we aim to inform about our uh, concerns, health concerns, environmental concerns. We want to counterbalance and provide context. I'm gonna give an example here. Let's say we want to inform about the uh, danger that the coal uh, generated electricity represents for air quality and uh, health. Like as much I think at, at, at the last uh, stats that we had are saying that uh, a, a few doses or near a hundred Canadians were dying every year because of poor air quality. So um, uh, fire coal generated electricity has uh, a role on that death toll. Uh, and then uh, we may need to counterbalance, for instance, uh, opinions from, from the industry, the power uh, uh, generation industry, the coal industry, it says, no, coal is good. We're making it cleaner. Well, we have to put that in context. It says, no, we're, you guys, you're actually killing people. So we advance our views. It says, with the same money, we could do much better. There is a lot of solar uh, potential in the south of Saskatchewan and Alberta. You don't need to burn anything there. It's like uh, it's, you, you have the, the energy coming down on you every day. And uh, as much as we can determine or influence the political agenda, and that's a very legitimate goal. Um, with all the information that we bring forward, that you will bring forward through your work, and uh, all the solutions that you are going to put forward, you want to determine the political agenda for the ongoing debates between elections and for the elections when parties have to have to present their their um, platforms and their their views for 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 their government. So we need to be strategic. So here are some basic questions that we have to ask ourselves before reaching out to media. So the very basic one: What do we want to say? So what's our message? 
The second one, why, what, what do we want? So I want to say that coal is bad for uh, human health and the environment. What's my goal? Well, my goal is that uh, I want a bill to be tabled proposing to phase out coal in my municipality, in my, in my province. Uh, so uh, why today? Well, because today it's a uh, world uh, coal day, whatever. It's, it, we, we have an excuse because today a new coal plant is being opened in North Saskatchewan, et cetera. So you have an, you have an, an anchor, you have an excuse. Um, and what is your target audience? Who are you talking to? Are you talking to your neighbors, to the neighbors of four blocks away from you that you don't know and are sitting in front of the TV? Or are you talking to the elected officials? Or are you talking to industry? So that's you, you have to figure those questions out. Uh, because also those questions, the answer to those questions are going to help you identify which media you should contact first. So what is news? What is newsworthy? Well, first, public interest. Uh, and it's, 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 a very in, it, it's a very easy concept in a way. It's, it's easy to grasp. What is of public interest? What may change people's decisions? What may, what may change what people do? Do not go there because it's dangerous. Go there because it's cheaper. Uh, do not eat this because it's gonna poison you or uh, do that because it's better for your health. So something that may affect people's decisions, people's security, it's of public interest. So what is newsworthy? Also the unknown, the new. We have uh, realized that uh, the, the humans were on earth for a half a million years because we have unburied something in Africa is called, well, that's the unknown, that's the new, local. That's a, it's called the thumb, the thumb rule. Uh, what is far away from you needs to be very, very big to be covered locally. So you need a massive earthquake, you need a tsunami on the other side of the world and a really high death toll for the news to be covered here in Canada. But if someone gets, uh, uh, killed in downtown Toronto by a mad driver, it's gonna get more coverage than the tsunami. It's, it's, a, it's a rule of proportion. So a small incident very close to home will get more or less the same coverage than a big incident very far away from home. So pertinence, uh, the human angle, is, is there emotion there? Is there someone suffering? Uh, is there something very emotive uh, it can be also good news. Um, kids being rescued from, from the mine in, in Indonesia, uh, no, in Thailand a, a few months ago, or the Chilean miners being, being rescued. It made the news. It was very human. It was a tragedy that ended up well. Uh, Non-mainstream stuff, uh, things that are very un, un, unusual, again. Um, controversial, something that comes uh, across uh, from, from the from the blind spot and that it's suddenly, oh, it makes everyone react. Uh, an unusual partnership or alliance, a union with an environmental group uh, fighting for, for the same cause when they were historically opposed. Uh, a shocking image, Greenpeace does, has been doing this for a number of decades now. Celebrities can always work, even either they are uh, against or with your cause but they always get news coverage. Uh, humor, that's a, a, a very, uh, it's, a diff it's difficult to use, but it's a very um, affordable resource. And action, again, uh, Greenpeace knows how to do this and everyone involved in civil disobedience also knows about action, but action can also be, um, be totally uh, legal and legitimate. A big demonstration, uh, a march, a big rally, uh, it, that's, that's action. Um, so uh, we have uh, an ambivalent relation to news. Either we follow them, uh, uh, mostly passively, or, or we make them. That's that's what we that's what we want to uh, that's what we want to do with the, the with the work that you are actually accomplishing, and uh, that's what we want to promote with this kind of training. So we follow news when fate makes an eruption in our life. 
there was a tsunami. So we, we follow you. So there is a, a sudden meltdown of a glacier in somewhere in Alaska and uh, one small village is uh, it's at risk of being just swept away. Well, that's fate. Uh, another stakeholder crazy situation that we do not control um, or we intervene in an ongoing debate. But we can also create news, handcraft news, when we intervene beyond a simple reaction. So not only we say we oppose the creation of more uh, coal-generated uh, electricity plants, but uh, we have also realized that there is unused money the, in, in a green fund that could be used right away to create a solar park. So it's more than a reaction. We are also uh, putting something forward, something that is new. We create an, ev an event. It can be even disruptive. Uh, we march, we, we protest, we release the controversial information. Uh, or that can also spark a new debate with a new questions. Uh, for instance, we realized through scientific research that, that 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 we produce or that we have access to that something represents a risk for for the human health and that was not considered a risk before uh, that's a new information certainly everything that touches on human health is news so there we spark a new debate so we are um, with with the work that we're doing that you are going to do with uh, municipalities and cities trying to retrieve data and to expose data uh, you're intervening in an ongoing debate, but you will spark a new debate because you will bring forward new information or information that was there and that was not uh, taken seriously or being, anal being analyzed in a larger context. So two examples. Uh, as I told you, I, I used to work with, with Greenpeace and back in 2013, um, we were uh, campaigning against um, uh, offshore drilling in, in, the Ar in the Russian Arctic. And one of uh, the Greenpeace ships uh, was, um, was taken by, by the Russian special forces, uh, even though it was in inter technically in international waters. We were protesting in international waters. And there were uh, 30 crew activists on board and they were detained. They were sent to a city in North Russia and there they were accused of piracy. That's a very serious crime under uh, the, Russia, the Russian uh, criminal uh, code and under international laws. And they could have been sent to prison in Russia for as, as much as 15 years. So it was a really serious uh, situation for the entire organization and for the activists, uh, for the families of the activists and for freedom of expression and freedom of dissent around the world. Um, Russia wanted to give uh, uh, an example by force and imprison these people and, and scare every activist who would dare to defy uh, the Russian right to drill in the Arctic and put the entire Arctic at risk. Uh, among those 30 people were two Canadians, one from Ontario and one from Montreal. So after uh, three months of inaction by the conservative Canadian government of the time, who did not uh, proactively work to uh, demand the liberation of its citizens. Um, it was basically uh, indifference, like inaction. We decided that it, the time uh, was ripe to do a big action here in Canada, in Montreal. So we escalated, we climbed the biosphere. Uh, and then we did a checklist. So is this really news worthy? Is this really news? We, we knew the answer was yes, but it's still interesting to make the checklist. This was of public interest. It could change people's perception and may act people and government um, proceed in a different way. 
it it was new. Uh, many things had happened in the in the biosphere in Montreal. It, it, it even burned once uh, in the 70s. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a very famous icon for Montreal, uh, along with the Olympic Stadium. Uh, we had a local el element uh, because one of the activists was from Montreal and the parents uh, live in Montreal. It was pertinent. It was in the news cycle already. Uh, it was profoundly human. Uh, someone who is uh, facing 15 years in prison uh, for protecting uh, the environment, it has a human angle. And the mother had been uh, going to TV shows and radio shows and usually crying in front of the cameras. And she was a very uh, touching uh, mom, desperate by the situation of her son. Uh, non-mainstream, maybe at that time it was already mainstream, but it was certainly controversial uh, because we were also defying uh, the indifference of the of the conservative government, and it was also controversial uh, because we were using the biosphere where we could also obtain an unusual partnership or alliance with the employees of the biosphere because the biosphere is a, mu is a museum for the environment. It's a museum about uh, energy transition and climate change. And the conservative government was threatening with cutting the budget of that museum as well. So we knew that the employees inside the biosphere would be happy for us with us protect, uh, protesting in this way. And they actually were. Uh, we wanted to obtain a shocking image, again, like climbing the biosphere and hanging that, that banner was uh, near 25 meters uh, wide so it was it was really huge and difficult to hang uh the activists themselves they have they have become uh celebrities by the time when we hung this banner and uh, there was also a, a number there were also a number of, of real celebrities around the world namely um emma thompson paul mccartney uh margaret adwood uh here in canada uh, I think even Pamela Anderson, and like a number of celebrities uh, that had put their voices forward to protect the Arctic and to uh, demand uh, the, the immediate uh, freedom for, for these uh, activists that were considered political prisoners by then. Uh, humor, not sure. Action, a lot. Climbing there, and we were really lucky because this was at seven in the morning and uh, we had a press release uh, and, and a team ready to call me and saying, hey, this is happening. Maybe you won't see it from Montreal. But there was a big traffic jam in the Highway 132, south of the biosphere at that time. And the helicopter from one uh, popular TV channel, TVA, uh, was just simply like covering the traffic. And they saw this happening and they stopped covering the traffic and they started trans transmitting, broadcasting this live. We didn't pitch anything. It just happened. It was random luck. I think the media would have come immediately, like 15 minutes after, and we would have had like great shots from the ground. But the helicopter made a hell of a difference. And uh, since all media constantly watch other media, the image that TVA was broadcasting live immediately go to the newsrooms of all the other media. And in 15 minutes without calling any media without sending out the press release, we got a number of TV trucks uh, like near the biosphere interviewing the parents uh, and our spokesperson and so on. And uh, it actually add pressure along with many other actions around the world. And the activists were uh, freed, were liberated um, 20 days after this action. So another example, a smaller one, um, here in Montreal, we've been trying to protect for a number of years the last uh, natural uh, forest in the west of the island uh, that it's uh, been threatened by um, uh, a house development, a housing development uh, that would basically destroy 400 hectares of, of beautiful wetlands. So uh, we wanted to do um, an inventory, a list of species at risk that 
could live in those wetlands. But the, um, the owner of the land, who is like in partnership with the developer, did not give us access to the place to actually take samples and uh, with, with a team of biologists and, and made the inventory of the, um, of the fauna and everything. So we used like improvised scientist kayak activist that went into those places with kayaks because you can claim the property of the land, but you cannot claim the property of uh, a stream or river that crosses the land and took samples from the kayak. And they also use um, like uh, animal waste to uh, to analyze the different uh, DNA that were present in the in the water, and they could make a, a characterization of the of the territory of the sector. Uh, so at what point we were able to bring to the attention of media a list of species at risk that were there that were known not known. So that was news, because we were not just trying to develop to cause urban sprawling in a nice place because there were trees or whatever. The answer were, well, there are lots of trees around Montreal. They were threatening with destroying a place where, where, where that, that was uh, hosting, that was home to many species at risk. So it was of public interest because people did not know that those species were there. It was local, it was in Montreal, that was happening in our backyard. It was pertinent and it was controversial because it was more complex and there was more at risk than what we had previously thought. So the sources of a journalist, uh, this is a classification, this is a list that I made myself. The, the sparehead, the one who puts forward a controversial, a controversial idea. Let's not build that new neighborhood, let's do a national park. That's a controversial idea, can't go the other way. Let's not do a national park, Let's do a, a mining project. The victims, everyone who is potentially affected by an idea can be the victims of poor air quality that live near a coal, a coal plant, uh, or can be the workers of the coal plant that are being affected by the idea of closing the coal plant. But there's always a victim in the stories. It's very rare that you find a story or an idea that do not have any beneficiaries and victims. The witnesses, everyone who is around and who has something to say, and everyone has something to say. Journalists, they do go around uh, making box pop. That's like the voice of the people. So uh, you can, and this, this is more, more, more um, common in radio. You can listen to a number of neighbors or random people in the street saying, well, I think that closing all the coal plants in Saskatchewan is a good idea because of this or that. Ah, I think it's a very bad idea because it will kill the economy. So those are the witnesses of the situation. The experts, the expert, the, 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 the doctor from the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment is gonna say, well, coal is killing like a hundred Canadians a year. Or the expert in that is being paid by the coal industry and say coal is very clean because now we can capture like carbon emissions and sink them in the ground or whatever. Yeah, I mean you know that's kind of both experts, etc. Et et lobby groups can be the coal industry or can be us. Lobby can be a very good and positive thing. So we can lobby for very good causes. We do not have to be afraid of lobby. The problem is when lobby gets confused with what get mixed with science. Science is not a lobby in itself. Science is research. And sometimes like uh, industry lobby groups are gonna accuse people trying to advance science of that they are just making lobby. Well, science is not a lobby. Lobby is advancing an idea with a solution and that's good lobby, but science is not a lobby in itself. So before reaching out to media, we have to know who are we? in this categorization, are we the sparehead? Uh, uh, are you the campaigner putting forward the idea of uh, closing a, a mine and making a, turning it into a lake with a national park around? Are you the victim of the mine? Are you the victim of the national park? Are you the witness? Are you the expert? Do you have something really, you have an expertise in this to share or are you the lobby group? And in the work that you are doing with the, with the municipalities now, yeah, you can actually find yourself in, in all of these roles. 
Most probably, I would say in the lobby group, but you can also be the expert because if you have been retrieving data from your municipality or from your other sources and you, you can uh, assert some of your conclusions that have been validated by a third part, uh, you are an expert in, in those data. If you have been the study the, the state of the bike lanes in your, in your city, and you have realized that your city ranks way below the average of all the cities around in the development or in the maintenance of your bike lanes, maybe you have a news and maybe you are an expert because you were the one like measuring the bike lanes and, and, and comparing all the standards. So for that very specific and circumscribed subject, you are also the expert. Uh, next slide. So you want to talk to media, you have to find the right journalist. And this requires a little bit of, of, of work. So let's say that you want to uh, talk about bike lanes because you want to reduce uh, traffic jams in your, in your city. And you want to talk to a journalist about bike lanes and traffic. Uh, well, there are less and less fewer and fewer journalists in this country because media it's in a financial crisis but even a few it's a still a lot of people for you so you have to find the one who is writing or who is interested in the subject you want to discuss with him so go to google news it's a it's a very good idea to start with in, in google news if you don't know where to start and put the name of your municipality or of your province uh bike lanes plus traffic jams or plus traffic or plus public transportation or plus infrastructure, whatever. You make the combination of keywords that you want. And you see in Google News, not in the, in the general results, but in news specifically, who has written lately about that. And most probably you will always find people who are writing about the subject you want to discuss or about a very close, closely related subject. And you write down a list of those journalists and the media they work for. And you also verify the angle. Are there F and O means uh, uh, for like for, for your cause, neutral or opposed. Most probably the journalist is going to be neutral, but some people who are columnists, they have very strong opinions. But people who are columnists are less um, inclined, are less open to, to, to talk to you. So uh, then you have to ask yourself, what, what should I say to that journalist? What's my message or information? So never communicate with a journalist without knowing him in advance, because it's, it's a it's a sign uh, of respect. When you start the conversation, say, well, I know you are writing about bike lines. I know that you have said this and that. Uh, I found interesting that you uh, that you covered this this issue that was uh, for the most under the radar. Um, so um, you you have to have an excuse to start a conversation. So never communicate if you don't know exactly what you are going to say, because a conversation that goes nowhere uh, is a missed opportunity. And it's probably a door that you are closing to yourself uh, because that journalist won't be uh, willing to talk to you next time or will be less willing to talk to you next time. So exchanges must be short and down to the point. You said this, uh, you should know this, you should consider this, and this is what will happen or this is what I have to, to share with you, this information. So keep it really down to the point. Polite, not over-friendly journalists, but may, it may happen for other reasons, but normally they are not your friends. Like the, the, the exchange can, may be very friendly, but they are not your friends and they don't have to be your friends because you need them to be perceived by the public as being independent for the information to be, uh, uh, to be taken seriously. So, and it's also fine to ask questions. Uh, if you are not sure if something is newsworthy, you can start a conversation with a with a journalist and say, like, look, there is a, uh, there is a, a coal plant that suddenly has uh, increased production in my in my in my area, and I have noticed that people with asthma uh, in my family are having more and more trouble or are seeing the doctor more often. 
uh, what do you think about it? It's okay to ask a question. And maybe this journalist in his answer is gonna tell you if what you are saying is newsworthy or not. Once you have created the opportunity for an interview, you have to get ready for it. So that means that you must control the message you want to convey and the person who will convey the message, who will be yourself or someone for, from your group. So this is where we, we, we have a little problem, is that for everything that is um, broadcast communication, uh, especially TV, uh, the message, the content seems to be less important than the rest. Of course, you cannot uh, tell lies, you cannot bullshit people, but your image, it's, it's really important and people are looking more at, at your face than hearing your words. So this comes from, from a study. I, the source is, is in, the, in the PowerPoint. Uh, Matthew will share it with you later. Uh, but the image accounts roughly for 50% of your credibility, the voice for the other 30%, and the content only for 20%. This doesn't apply to written media. In written media, content is king. But most people use broadcast media. So they generally want uh, understand and make others understand. Tell a story that feels complete in a short time or text. So when you listen to it or when you read it, uh, uh, you have the, the feeling, the impression of having uh, understood or read everything that you needed to know. Obtain enough verifiable information and get a phrase, a sound bit or an image that are eloquent and, uh, eloquent and that contain most of the story in itself. So that, that is why the, the key messages are so important. And basically this, this short training, it's all about you delivering key messages because that's maybe what's gonna happen with the information that you are gonna get through your work. So what is a key message? It's a very short statement, very, very short. It's just a few seconds. It's a simple truth with simple facts and simple words aiming uh, to change the audience perception of an issue. And in a few words, and this is the most important part, a key message communicates a problem or, or, or an issue. It can be a good thing also, a solution and an action. Why do we need them? Because it's, it's basically the only thing that people are gonna remember from your intervention. It's a very, very, very short sentence. And it allows you to bring your, your audience exactly where you want them to be. Without key messages, if you just stumble with your words, you don't have the control of the interview. You don't have the control of the situation. And the, uh, the journalist, even intellectually with, with honesty, can uh, like convey your, your, your messages in the wrong way. He can make a mistake. He can misunderstand you. Uh, he can uh, quote you in the in the wrong way, and that's it. Once it's out there, there is not much you can do. So, if well prepared, if you are well prepared, a journalist will have no choice but to report your key messages exactly the, the way you uh, created them and exactly the way you deliver them. So a few examples, and these examples I created them specifically for, for, for you based on the work that you are doing. Let's say bike lanes in Scamborough, that's a, that, that village does not exist. Bike lanes in Scamborough are scarce and dangerous. Studies show we can reduce traffic congestion and carbon emissions by investing in longer, smarter and safer bike lanes now. That's a, that's a key message. What is the problem? Bike lanes in Scamborough are there are not enough and they are dangerous. Uh, what is the solution? Build more and make them better. Um, and um, how, do, how do we get there? By taking political action, by investing. That's the verb there. Another key message, poor air quality is linked to hundreds of premature deaths per year in Toronto. Yet the city has the resources to achieve transportation electrification by 2013. So in just 10 years, 
Toronto could have the cleanest air among big cities in Canada. So you, what, what is the problem? The quality of the, of, of the air in Toronto is really bad. People are dying. So the problem is people are dying because of bad air quality. Uh, what is the solution? Electrifying uh, the, 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 the transportation system completely. Uh, and uh, how, how do we get there? By using the, res the financial resources that are already available. And the cherry on the cake is there, like the message of optimism. And this is this is aiming, this aims at, at creating political momentum and support. Imagine in 10 years, Toronto will have the cleanest air among big cities in Canada. We, our very nature is in being better or best than someone else. So just the idea of having the cleanest air in Canada, it's something appealing. And if you say that you also have the money to, to do that, why not? Uh, so you always have to put the accent more in the solution and how to get there than in the problem. The problem has to be mentioned because without problem, why do anything? But we need, uh, and all the research and communications points in the same way, we need to put the accent in the, in the solution. So every time you expose a problem, if you want to be effective in communications, it has to be glued together. They always, a problem has to travel with at least one solution to it and one possible action. If not, the accumulation of bad news brings us to inaction. But the bad news paralleled with solutions that are attainable for everyone moves us to action. And that's not my opinion, that's communications research. Uh, and the third one, people in my neighborhood support the idea of having a net zero public library. It's cleaner, inspiring, and even cheaper in the long term. Uh, our major, we understand here that the mayor is opposed to building the net zero public, should listen to citizens and embrace a long-term sustainable vision. That's a discussion that could happen everywhere in Canada. Like from now on, most of the public buildings should be uh, net zero. So uh, those three examples may apply to situations that you may face yourself in the future. So the most common mistakes, deal with the interview as if it was a simple conversation. You have, you, you have to be yourself, but you cannot be too informal. You have to be respectful of the, of, of the journalist and of many people that you don't know and that you, don't want, that you want to, to establish a dialogue through the media. So when you are talking to TV viewers of a news broadcast, they are of different ages and backgrounds and skills and religions and you name it. So you have, you have to uh, adopt a, a, a respectful tone and posture uh, that is not too familiar, that is not too distant and that it's one size fits all in a way. Uh, another mistake is give too much information. You, 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 you may stumble with the flowers on the carpet. That's like too much is too much. So the key message is they have to show one problem, one solution, one action. If you name three problems, you say, the problem in my city is that there are too many uh, cars uh, plus the coal plant uh, there and the bike lanes that are insufficient. Uh, we should do this and that and that. So what, what do we get at the end of the day that there are many problems and many solutions? You cannot retain the information and the, and the journalist, good luck for him. He cannot get a quote out of it. He cannot get an audio of it. He cannot get a sentence. It's very difficult to edit that. So the more your key messages travel like bricks, uh, the better your, your chances of not being betrayed and of being just report it exactly the way you talk. And the other question would be to answer too shortly, to say, yes, no. So do you think we should have more bike lanes? Oh, yes, for sure. So that's a, that's a missed opportunity. You should say oh, we should have more bike lanes because it, it could help us solve uh, our huge uh, traffic jumps and people could spend more time with their families. Like, Show, 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 show the destination and use every opportunity you have to deliver a key message. Never just stop at a yes or no. Always size the opportunity to deliver a key message. You, you, you have fought 
for that opportunity, you, you cannot waste it. So before an interview, uh, we're okay with the time, or, or before any situation where you face media, like uh, a march, a rally, a citizen, a town hall, you have to prepare, bring some and write down your key messages. This is usually best to do it with other people. The key message is wrote by three people. They usually read better, look better, and travel better than key messages written by only one people. You have to confront your ideas. Problem, solution, action. It's as simple as that, always. Identify your public audience. You can even imagine the other person. You can imagine how that person looks and in, in his kitchen, living room, car, whatever. And rehearse, you have to rehearse. Uh, especially if, 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 if we are shy people, the very first interviews are very um, difficult and you may be a little bit shaky and insecure. But if you do that, if you get used to listen to your own voice, if you get used to see your own image, like just rehearsing the key messages that you wrote with your group and getting your friend or yourself to uh, record uh, your face reading the key messages or delivering the key messages by heart and then watching them, you will correct yourself lots of mistakes. And we're going to see some of those mistakes now. So basic tips, be yourself but under your best light. Use simple language, use image and simple metaphors if possible. Metaphors are great. Don't be afraid of use of using uh, pop culture. Metaphors are great. And if they are visual metaphors, even better, because in, in like in radio, for instance, you cannot see things, but you can imagine things. So if you give visual metaphors to illustrate a problem or a solution, People can visualize it and they are gonna remember uh, better. When asked a question, listen carefully and acknowledge the question. You don't have, you have to, to, to actually make a pause. You need one second to think about your answer. You cannot uh, start speaking on the journalist. Avoid negative language, stick to truth and fact. Do not talk about what you don't know. Stick strictly to what you know. Be humble, talk slowly. Not as I do here, like slower than this. Uh, curb your passion. So look at the interviewer, not at the camera. Never look at the camera. You look angry uh, or crazy if you look straight at the camera. You look at the journalist and feel that looking at the eyes of the uh, in the eyes of the journalist is like looking uh, in the eyes of your audience, actually. Uh, and be mindful of your body language and your face expression. Uh, they should not contradict your key messages. You cannot talk about uh, the death toll of uh, bad air quality uh, with a smile. You cannot talk about uh, impacts on human health with a smile, or you cannot talk about a great solution while frowning. And I mean, solutions look uh, like happiness a little bit. So don't put your hands in your pocket because that's like, like too informal and in some cultures is disrespectful. Don't be too relaxed as if you didn't care. Uh, don't lean on the table like that. Don't, don't never, like, actually never hit a table because the, the microphones are also on the table so it can make a weird effect. Uh, and it's also like aggressive. Uh, don't swing sideways or don't be, don't shake nervously. It shows like you're insecure and people may doubt of your uh, honesty. Uh, don't be too rigid because then you look like a robot or like a computer and you look like you are memorizing and that you are repeating a message that is not actually what you think. So you have to be uh, yourself, but in a very careful way. So that's the end of my presentation about key messages and how engaging with journalists, but I'm sure you have some questions. So let's use the, the last few minutes that we have for, for your questions. Terrific. Thank you so much, Diego, for being with us. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions that have come in, and I will uh, maybe ask one while waiting for others. Um, the first one being, um, when it comes to owning and controlling your image, is, um, is it important to, in written um, media, to submit an image when you're submitting an op-ed, uh, op for example, or if you're speaking with a 
uh, journalist, uh, should you also present or suggest an image to accompany your piece? Uh, or the, I mean, the, the, obviously the journalist has um, the choice to use it or not, but um, have, you, have you seen that? I think, it's a, I think it's a very, very good idea. If you have an image that illustrates a problem, uh, and also, if, if you have the rights on the image, you cannot submit an image that is copyrighted <laughs> and that does not belong to you, as an example. But if you, let's say that uh, there is a problem with um, the security aspect, the safety act aspect of a bike lane. And uh, there are, I don't know, there is a problem every day between uh, car drivers and uh, people riding on bikes at a certain intersection. Uh, and that is that is discouraging people from uh, using that specific bike lane. Uh, if you have a good photograph that explains everything, if you have a photograph of a, of a driver uh, yelling at a, someone like standing on his bike at that specific corner, that photograph is worth uh, a lot because it explains everything that you're also explaining with your words, with your statement, with your key message. Yes, sure, an image can actually help your cause. And also we live in a very uh, visual and graphic world. Uh, and sometimes for, um, uh, sometimes the success of a news piece uh, is also in the image that travels with it. Uh, journalists, they do have resources to find good images but sometimes they do not exactly grasp or they do not find the image that is local. Local is always best. So if you are talking about the problems with your own bike lines, and if you have the right image of a bike line in your city, send it along your, your statement or send it later, but just make sure that the image gets to the journalist. It's a very, very good idea. Terrific. Thanks so much. And maybe one last question before we finish up, and that is, um, when sending, when circulating a, a press uh, release, you, I've got, I've got something to say. It, it has met the criteria. Um, should I? Is there value in circulating it to everybody that I can get an email address for? Uh, the logic being, uh, even if they don't cover environment, or even if they're not going to report on what I'm saying, it could have an impact on their perception of what is public interest in the future. If they see that there's a citizen group active on climate and they're interested in air quality or bike lanes, maybe that will influence that journalist's reporting on a connected issue in the future. And that could impact their decision, yes or no, to cover these issues if they see that there's people you know, uh, speaking up about them. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Th there is one risk here, is that if you communicate uh, that, that, that's why I was saying in the, in the training that you have to know your journalists. If you communicate with a journalist with a totally unrelated issue and the journalist has never talked about that and there are very low chances that the journalist is going to get interest in that, you may be killing the opportunity of another story that you will bring to the attention of that journalist. Let's say that in your research with your group, you want to talk about bike lanes but you also want to talk about the financial uh, advantages or benefits of uh, net zero buildings for, for the city. So if you write, if you send them um, an email to a journalist that has only covered in the past uh, financial as financial stuff, like for the sea or, or things that have to do with the economy, and you send him an email about bike lanes, that journalist may actually block your email or send you to the trash, whatever, like put a filter on you. I said, I'm not gonna open this email again. Why is this person sending this to me? I don't have anything to do with that subject. But you may, you may need that journalist out the round for another subject that is related to his work. So I would, my instinct tells me that I would not communicate with journalists that are not somehow related to my issue because I, I may need those journalists down the road for something else that it will be actually related to what, what I'm working. So I, I, I think I would rather segment. And yes, you can 
enlarge your pool and say, okay, it's not directly related, but maybe he's interested. But it, if it's totally unrelated, I would not contact the journalist. We live in a world where marketing and communications and everything is tailored, that you have to meet people where they are, and people have very few time, and they, they are like flooded with emails every day. So you have to show that you are relevant, that you know what the journalist is doing. And I would invest more time in finding the right journalist than in finding many journalists on unrelated issues. Because two journalists that give you, one journalist that give you very good coverage will guarantee, it will give you more impact and probably more coverage because journalists copy other journalists and say, oh, if he's talking about this, I'm gonna talk about this because it looks important. Or are people started talking about that or social media is now trending on that subject because he's copied that. So I would invest more time or more effort in finding the three or four right journalists that on like trying to reach out to a hundred journalists that are in unrelated issues. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. That's uh, all we have time for this evening. And it, it has been a pleasure. And I look forward to launching into 2019 with everybody with the, um, the standings in hand and with these webinars uh, at our fingertips, able to jump through them. Uh, again, the slides, as Diego mentioned, will be posted as well to climatehub.ca and uh, really looking forward to making an impact in 2019 with you all. Thank you very much, Diego, for being with us. All the pleasure is mine and congratulations to all. And thank you for all the valuable work that you are doing. Thanks a lot. Thank you.